D Ray. Hello. This one's on. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll open us with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Hey, Wolf. What's going on? Knock. I'm talking to you. What are you doing? All right. Are you going to be good? No. All right, let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, dear God, it is good to be in your house this morning, dear Lord. Dear God, I just pray that you just. Uh, be with us this morning, fill this place with your spirit, dear Lord. I pray that you just be with Brother David as he brings your uh, word to us this morning, dear God. And I pray that you be with us as we uh, sing hymns of praise to you this morning, dear Lord. And I pray that you just be with the ones who aren't here this morning for whatever reason, dear God, if they're traveling or whatever, just be with them and keep your hands upon them. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is At the Cross, hymn 139.
It's weird, but y'all not having to sit down. I didn't know what to do. All right, well, it's good to have everybody here this morning. Uh, I do just want to remind you of a few things. Uh, first off, uh, I know you're all excited on pins and needles, can't hardly wait. But uh, immediately following service today, we will have a business meeting. I knew it. Some of you are like, I've been looking forward to this all week. Well, the day has arrived, so just behave yourself, and I do mean that literally. When we get to business meeting, please behave yourself. We don't need any of those unruly business meetings. No, I don't know of anything that's really coming up, so uh, it should be pretty quick, but that'll be immediately following service today. I say immediately. I'll give you a chance to hug neck, shake hands, go to the bathroom, do your thing, and then uh, we'll meet back in here and we'll get that taken care of. Uh, uh, after business meeting, most of you are free to go. Five of you get to stay for a little extra bonus time. No, it's not detention or anything like that. Uh, we do have a uh, nominating committee meeting today. Um, it's time for us to start looking forward to next year, filling the spots for all our committees. And so uh, if you were on the nominating committee and you're going, I don't know if I am or not. If you did not receive a phone call this week reminding you, you're not on the nominating committee. So you're like, yes, I'm off the hook. But uh, there will be a nominating committee following our business meeting. Uh, we'll meet in the Sunday school room across from the church office. Uh, this one should also be pretty quick. Uh, we're, we're not filling out committee lists today. This is just kind of giving you your marching orders so that you can get started. But if you're on the nominating committee, please don't forget we have a meeting uh, this afternoon right after business meeting. All right, one more meeting, then we'll get on to some actual ministry stuff here. Uh, budget and finance. If you're on that committee... We will be meeting uh, 5.30 Wednesday night to start going and making our new church budget, our, our proposed church budget for 2022. So if that's you, uh, we'll meet here at 5.30. I don't know which room, more than likely probably uh, this Sunday school classroom down here. Um, but we'll start that. The good news about having it at Wednesday at 5.30, we're limited to an hour. It will not be more than an hour because i got Bible study starting at 6.30. So anyway, budget and finance, uh, Wednesday, 5.30. All right, that's all the committee meetings for now. You're like, thank goodness. The only other thing I've got to remind you of is our shoe boxes. No, we hadn't packed them up yet. They just removed the decorations. Uh, we are well on our way to having what we need to pack the 60 shoe boxes that the children set as a goal. Uh, there are a couple things that you can do to still help. Uh, one of them, remember our blessings board that we put up down here? Uh, so you can put a need or something that you have that you can share. There is a need on there, and it pertains to our shoe boxes. Now, I could stand up here and tell you what that need is, but I'm not going to. I'm going to make you go down there and check the board so that people actually use the board. But there is uh, something on the board that they could use to kind of finish out these shoe boxes. And so if uh, you're interested, check that out and help them out in that way. Uh, the other thing, uh, we will pack them up soon. And that means it's going to be time here in just, what, about three weeks when they have to be turned in. Uh, with that, it's $9 per box shipping. And so if you would like to help with shipping costs, uh, you can drop that in the offering plate. Just mark on it what you are giving it for, and we'll make sure it gets uh, to the shoebox uh, line item or whatever we're going to do it out of. But uh, several of you have already given money towards shipping. We thank you for that. Uh, it's just another way to help with this ministry, uh, but that's where we stand right now. So uh, those are some things we got going on, some ways that you can help. Uh, do y'all have any other announcements this morning? All right, well, we got some folks out traveling today. Some folks just, uh, well, let's be honest, it's muzzle loader season uh, as of yesterday. And so they're out there communing with the Lord in the woods. Uh, so that means we got a few fewer number here than we have in the last few weeks that just means you got to sing louder to make up the difference and so sing loud put a smile on your face and let's just worship the lord together uh before we start our next hymn uh lucas our drummer warren he made all region he's in in singing, not playing the drums, in singing, and he, and he won't mic up and sing with me, so, but he's going to get to try out for all state, right, Lucas?
はい。Wait, what? Yeah. After Christmas, he's probably going to make all reason for band. So there's going to be no reason for him not to be able to play his drums and sing at the same time. <laughs> all right, and, it, and it, it, y'all know Zach ain't here. So what do I do? I do hymns. So we're going to have to do a lot better than we did on the first one. <laughs> Because y'all look like, y'all was horrible looking, I'm telling you. I know it's not upbeat. Ain't none of them going to be upbeat, and they're just going to be hymns. But we're still singing praise to, to God. So stand up. Let's see if it works better. Hymn 203, his name is Wonderful. Y'all may be seated if you want to, or you can keep standing, whatever you want to do. Our next hymn is Oh How I Love Jesus, 217. Stand up. And being y'all don't have a hymn, we're going to sing the first, second, and the last. We're going to skip one.
last song is The Solid Rock, hymn 406. Just for Mr. Daniel Courtney. Lucas, I had no idea. I'm going to tell you what, though. We're going to get you like one of those one-man band kits. And you're going to be able to sing, play, dance, whatever your heart desires. You know, I, you, you're a multi-threat. All right, kiddos. Uh, Miss Becky is heading to Children's Church. Man, if my kid would be that excited at home, we would be in good shape. Oh, she's skipping down the aisle. The rest of you, we're going to be back in the book of Exodus this week, Exodus chapter 4. Uh, last week we started talking about this idea of fear not and how we can live boldly in a scary world. And with that thought in mind, I want to ask you a question. Have any of you ever had a situation come up in your life where it just seemed to really be too big for you? The moment seemed too big, it seemed a little too overwhelming, too scary, and you just... If we're honest, when those moments crop up, our first thought is not, oh, thank goodness it's been a while since I've had one of these. No, our first thought is, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to start tackling this problem. I don't even know uh, which end is up. It just seems overwhelming to us. And it reminded me, uh, if I say these three letters, FDR, who knows what I'm talking about? Some of you kids are like, I know I should have paid a little more attention. Yeah, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was our 33rd president. And when Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office, it was really kind of one of these situations where it was just kind of overwhelming. There was a lot of things going on in our country. It was in pretty rough shape. And if I was the one who had just got elected, I would have taken a big breath and go, okay, where do we go from here? Because here's the thing. When he took office, unemployment was high. Now, these days, unemployment is high, at least compared to what we know high as. When he took office, one out of every four able-bodied, eligible Americans were unemployed. 25% of the workforce unemployed. And congratulations, Mr. President. We want you to come up with a plan to fix it. Overwhelming. Uh, when he took office, World War II was looming. It was 1933, but 
the wheels were already being set in motion over in Europe for World War II to begin. And we knew it. And he knew that we had little appetite to be in another world conflict. He knew that uh, the attitude of American citizens was one that we didn't want to be in a war. And he's having to try and juggle this. It's overwhelming. They would tell you that because of the Great Depression, because of the events overseas, that public confidence in our country at that time was at an all-time low, which seems really like a bold statement. When I look around our country today and you hear all these polls about, well, how do you think the government's doing? Or how do you think the president's doing? And the poll numbers are not good. And I'm going to tell you, it, it doesn't matter if it's red or blue. The poll numbers are not good. But it says at this time, public confidence was at an all-time low. Nobody thought it was going to get better. Nobody saw any light at the end of the tunnel, and if they did, they were pretty sure it was the train coming down the tracks. The president steps into this kind of situation, and I'm going to tell you, if I was him, I would have been completely, 100% overwhelmed, wringing my hands, not knowing where to start. But it was in this backdrop that he takes the stage on March 4th, 1933, for his first inaugural address. And he says these words that we have heard many times before. This is what FDR said. He said, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. See, some of you did pay attention in history class. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Like I said last week, we started talking about the fact that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid as we live out the assignment that God has given to us individually. We don't have to be afraid just because things are hard around us. And we talked about how God calls us to an assignment. How each and every believer, God has called out. To do good works. God has given us an assignment to do. And it doesn't matter what it is. We don't have to be afraid of how it's going to turn out. We talked about that for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at different truths that we learned from the life of Moses. And we said that last week the truth that we learned was that it didn't, we didn't have to be afraid. Because God knows what? Where we are. Man, how comforting is that? That right here when God calls you and he gives me an assignment, it's not somewhere out of left field. God knows exactly where I am. And it didn't matter what my past is, what questions I have, what insecurities are bubbling inside of me. God has handpicked me for kingdom opportunities. And folks, he's handpicked you, despite your past, despite your questions, despite your insecurities, he's handpicked you as well. For kingdom opportunities, and you don't have to be afraid. Today, we're going to look at another truth from the life of Moses. And so truth number two is this. God knows what needs to be done. See, God doesn't just know where you are. He doesn't just know where to find you when he called you. He knows what needs to be done in the situation that he's calling you to. And because of that, I don't have to be afraid of the situation. I don't have to be afraid of what it might entail because God's already got a plan. So we're going to see here in Exodus 4 what happens when Moses finally gets on board and says, All right, God, I'm in. So Exodus 4, we're going to pick up in verse 19. It says, Now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Now, most of us, we've been around church long enough. We kind of know how this story plays out, don't we? Moses does indeed make it back to Egypt, doesn't he? He gets there, he goes and he stands before Pharaoh, and he starts telling him all the things that God said. But over and over again, what we see is, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. 
Let my people go. No. And every time God says, I'm going to get your attention, Pharaoh. And we know that there were plagues that came upon Egypt. And every time, Pharaoh still refused. But what was the last one? The death of the firstborn. Here, God is telling Moses the plan from the get-go. Moses, I know how to get where we need to get to. I know what needs to be done for this plan to work. You just got to trust me. When we started this passage, we find that God had already found Moses. Moses was in the desert. He was doing what he had just done to go hide. He was taking care of the flocks. God found him in the desert, but he told Moses on that day, I've got a plan for you. I've got an assignment for you, Moses. And can I just stop here for a second? Most of us need to get through that right there because we're still fighting it. That God has a plan for you and me, each one of us. God has an assignment for us. God never designed us. God never intended for us to just come sit in our pew and be content. He's got a plan and a purpose and an assignment for you. God found Moses right where he was and says, I've got an assignment for you, Moses. We read last week that Moses had several questions and objections. But in the end, by the time we get to the passage that we've read today, Moses has accepted the assignment. Now, I want you to just think with me for just one second. This wasn't just any small assignment, was it? This was a big deal. This was a, a, a life-changing assignment. Think about what God had asked him to do. He said, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. Well, why did Moses end up in Midian to begin with? Remember, he, he killed the Egyptian and hid the body. And God says, now I want you to go back and confront your past. Well, we could just spend weeks right there, couldn't we? Because there's some of us who are like, I don't ever want to think about my past again. I sure don't want to look face to face with it. But God says, I have an assignment for you, Moses. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have to go confront your past. He says, but not just that. He said, when you get there, I want you to go speak to Pharaoh. Yes, Moses, I understand that you have a hard time speaking in public. And yes, I understand that Pharaoh is the most powerful human being on the face of the planet at this time in history. Yes, Moses, I understand exactly who he is. But I want you to go speak to him, and I want you to tell him what I'm going to tell you from me. This assignment's getting tough. But he goes on, he says, when you get there, and you tell him what I've told you, he said, I want you to demand that he let my people go. Folks, this was not an easy task by any stretch of the imagination. This was going to be difficult beyond anything that Moses could have ever thought or imagined. And to say it was unlike anything he had ever done before is a dramatic understatement. This is one of those situations where it would have been easy for Moses to be overwhelmed. It would have been easy for Moses to go, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know what, where to begin. It would have been easy for him to be afraid and just say, this is too much. So he could have continued in fear. He could have been overwhelmed by the moment. Instead, this is what we see out of Moses. We see that Moses learned and trusted that not only did God find him for a reason, but he knew exactly what needed to be done to accomplish the task. Now folks, if that was true for Moses, don't you think it's true for us as well? If God knew where to find you in the middle of all the mess and everything else, if God knew where you were and he says, I still handpicked you, if God knew all of that, don't you think he can be trusted with a plan to accomplish it? Yeah. See, when God gives us an assignment the way he did Moses, one of the things that often makes us afraid is that we don't have any idea of where to start or what to do. We don't. We feel completely lost. But we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to have fear. Because God already knows what needs to be done. He's already set the wheels in motion. He already has a plan. Which makes me ask myself a very difficult question. 
If in every situation, if every circumstance, if every assignment that God has ever called me out to, if he already has a plan in each and every one of those, why don't I get it? Why do I miss the plan? Why do I find myself worried and being anxious over something that he's already got planned out? The problem is I miss the plan. Why? Well, that's the question we're going to try and answer today. Why is it that I have fear and I miss the plan? How is it that I can overcome fear and take part in God's plan? There's three things that I think we need to do, and we see them as we look at this passage, because I think it's what Moses did. The first thing we got to do if we want to overcome fear and take part in God's plan, we must listen for instructions. I know, I see the look on some of your faces already. You're like, you just had to say it, didn't you? <laughs> Dad, gummit, you had to say it. Any of you ever have a problem with instructions? Ladies, if your husband is not going to amen that, go ahead and amen for him. Because, look, I know. We have a problem with instructions. And here's the thing. Gentlemen, usually it's not because even a pride issue of, no, I'll figure it out. It's usually not even that, hey, I, I think I'm good on my own. Sometimes instructions are given, and they go in one ear and right out the other. Why? Because we ain't listening for them. We have a problem with instructions, and my wife will tell you, my biggest problem with instructions is that I often don't take the time to listen for them. You know how it is. Christmas is coming up. Your child has that big honking box of toy that, you know, you pull out the page and it's like 500 steps to put it together. And you're like, I ain't got time for that. We'll just figure it out. 12 hours and a heart attack later, you're going, what do I do with that book? And why do I have all these extra pieces? Yeah, but a lot of times we don't take the time to listen to the instructions, to look for the instructions. So we'll, end up, we'll worry and we'll panic and we'll strategize trying to figure it out. All the while it has never dawned on us to look and see, hey, is there already a blueprint for this? Is there already a plan out there that I can follow for this? Look, I struggle with this. Oh, I just got to come up with a plan. My wife will tell you that is me to a T. I just got to come up with a plan. I got to figure out how we're going to move forward. I got to know. I got to know. <laughs> All the while, I'm like, if I just be quiet for a minute, the Lord's probably going to make his plan known. But I just don't listen for it. I don't look for it. I miss the instructions because I'm just not in that place. Why? Because I'm not still enough to listen. I had a conversation with a family member recently. And there were some things going on and they were venting and just kind of frustrated. And I told them, I said, I love you. You know I love you. And I mean it as just lovingly as I possibly can. I said, but you got to shut up. And they were like, what? And I said, what's Psalm 4610 tell us? Be still and know that I'm God. I said, there's times that we don't hear what God's trying to tell us because we won't shut up long enough to hear the instructions. And as soon as the words left my mouth, it was like the Lord said, are you hearing yourself? Do you hear the advice that you just gave? Because little did my family member know that I was in that situation. I was the one struggling and anxious, trying to strategize and come up with a plan. And it was shut up. To shut up and listen. That's what God tells us. Be still and know that I am God. So I had to ask myself that day, well, what, what does that look like? How do I just be still? I mean, is this me just sitting off in a quiet room somewhere, nothing going on, and just, God, is that you? No, I'm going to tell you, if that's my idea of being still and being quiet, it drives me insane. Uh, I, I can't handle that. Uh, and if... I sit there for too long, I'm going to fall asleep, and I sure ain't going to hear nothing then. So what's it mean to be still before the Lord? Well, there's some things I think we need to do. First one's pretty obvious. You need to pray. 
I'm not talking about God is great, God is good prayers. You need to pray. You know, throw it out there. What is it that's got you burdened? What is it that's got you all flustered and anxious? Lay it out there. And then shut up. Listen for the response. As we pray, it's a conversation between us and God. And any good conversation cannot be one-sided. But that's what we make prayer far too often, isn't it? Lord, I need this and this and this. And hang on, let me get to page two of my prayer list. And I also need you to do this, this, and this. Amen. And there's never a point where we just listen. If I want to hear the instructions, i got to approach God in prayer and listen to what he has to say to me. I've also got to open up his word. It tells us quite clearly that this is his revelation to us. It is an invaluable tool that we have as we approach life. He's going to show us what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will as we look through his word. Folks, I don't know how many times in my life I have been completely clueless as to what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And you know what I usually find? I'll take stock of, well, how much have I been in God's Word? And you know the times that I'm the most confused? The times when I haven't been in His Word. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You get in there and you get to reading, and it may be something you've read hundreds of times over in your life. And that one, it might as well just been smacked upside the head with a brick. Like this one was tailor-made for me. This was my life verse for today. This is what's going on with me right now. Yes, Lord, I understand. I see it. It's written right there in front of me. We've all had that happen before. But that doesn't happen if I'm not in His Word. So part of being still, part of listening for instructions, is getting in the Word and seeing what He has to say to me. How he wants to point me in the right direction through that. Now here's another one. Seek godly advice. Now some of us we go, nah, I don't really like to burden people with my stuff. I just really want to, I'm kind of private. I don't like to talk about it. And I get that. But the Bible is very clear that we're here to support one another, to encourage one another, to bear one another's burdens. And so we ought to learn to lean on one another. But folks, can I urge you to be cautious? I'm not saying every time you got a question, you go to Facebook and go, hey, quick question, survey, what do y'all think I ought to do? Because you're going to get some answers that are not what you ought to do. Seek godly advice. People that you know who are seeking the Lord, who are praying praying on your behalf, who are in the Word on their own, seek those people out and go, I just really am struggling right now. Do you have anything that you could help me? Do you have any advice for me? Seek godly advice. I can't tell you how many times in my life that's been the case. I've gotten still enough to say, Lord, I don't have it figured out. I don't know what to do. And he'll bring somebody across my path that has the exact right word at the exact right moment. And in that moment, it just clicks. And you just know that they are speaking from the Lord. They may not even know it. They may not have any idea what is going on in you. But you just know because it clicks. Seek godly advice. All of these are ways that we can be still before the Lord and listen to his instructions. Because here's one thing I'm 100% certain of. When we get still, God will speak. It may not be saying the thing that you want him to say, but when we are still before him, God will speak. And it just makes good sense. But you think about it. If God is going to be the one who gives you the assignment, if God is the one who's found you where you are, handpicked you for the assignment, he wants you to get the instructions. Why? Because there is no one who wants to see the, the assignment done correctly more than him. He wants you to get it. He wants you to hear the instructions. He wants you to do it, not just the right thing, but the right way. He's going to tell you. But we've got to listen. 
we want to be able to overcome this fear of the unknown, I got to be willing to listen for the instructions that he's going to give me. Moses did. God told him, go back to Egypt. And Moses said, that's a lot of baggage. But if you say go, I'm going. He listened for the instructions. The next thing we got to do is we must act obediently. Moses went. He heard the instructions. He obeyed. He went back to Egypt and he said and did everything exactly the way that God told him to do it. It's the same for us. We must act obediently. See, when we listen for instructions, we're still before the Lord and we hear what he has to say to us. When he reveals his plan, that is not the end of the conversation. That is the beginning. When he reveals his plan, we have to actively pursue and follow it. And here's the kicker. We have to actively pursue and follow it, whether he shows us a little bit or the whole enchilada. How many of you have ever been in this boat? Lord, I just really feel like you're, you're speaking to my heart. I think you're calling me to something, Lord. And I, I think I know what it is, but God, I just, I just need more of the picture. I need you to reveal a little bit more of it to me so I can feel comfortable that this is really of you. Folks, that's not how it works. Whether he shows us the puzzle piece or the whole puzzle, our response in every situation, whatever it is that he has given us to be obedient to, we have to be obedient then. It wouldn't have been much to Moses' credit if he had heard God's plan but refused to take part in it. I mean, imagine how much different the story would have looked. Burning bush, man, awesome moment. Uh, he's standing there before the Lord. They're having this conversation. The Lord says, Moses, I have a plan for you. I have an assignment for you. I want to use you to free my people. Imagine if Moses said, wow, that, that is quite humbling. It really is. I mean, out of all the people you could have picked, you picked me. I don't even know what to say, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for thinking of me, but I'm going to pass. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Yeah, I mean it. I mean, I really, nothing personal. I am really honored that you thought of me. But no, I just got too much going on right now. I mean, this, this is just a little too much. So I'm going to pass. The story looks vastly different. Folks, here's the thing. We must act obediently. It's not enough just to hear God. It's not enough just to know that he is calling us or even to know what he's calling us to. We must act obediently. When we look at scripture as in its entirety, we see that's one of his key themes. Is obedience over and over again we see where we're supposed to act obediently towards God we see this played out story after story character after character this morning there's a couple things I want us to understand about biblical obedience what does that look like when we see this concept in Scripture what is it talking about and what does it mean for me first thing I want you to understand is this Biblical obedience is a complete surrendering of ourselves. This isn't a pick and choose type operation. This isn't, hey, God called me to do this, so I'm going to give him a little bit. This isn't, hey, God called me to uh, do something dramatic, so I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to test the water, you know, just kind of see how it is. No, it is a complete surrendering of ourselves. I don't get to set terms or conditions. Okay, Lord, I know you're calling me. Yes, I'll do it, but I won't go any farther than this right here. First off, that's incredibly bold. It's incredibly foolish. Because what I'm really saying when I set terms and conditions, I'm not saying yes at all, am I? God says, I've called you to a purpose, and you're only willing to come right here. That's not obedience at all. Which is a complete 
surrendering of ourselves. No terms, no conditions, just 100% submission to the will of the Father. That's what we saw modeled from Jesus, wasn't it? Jesus said, look, here we are. I know the cross is before me. I know what's coming. If we can do this another way, let's do it that way. But there wasn't. And so what were his words? How did he close that time of prayer? Not my will, but yours. 100% submitted to the Father. No terms, no conditions. And folks, I find myself in that place often. Lord, I'll say yes, but, you know, can we do this? Or, you know, if, you'll, if I do this, then you do that. Uh-uh. You don't bargain with God like he's some genie in a lamp or something. It's just, yes, we act obediently. We give him what he's called for. So when we look at scripture, that's what it is. It's this complete surrendering of ourselves. But there's something else I want you to see about biblical obedience. It must be done without delay. It must be done without delay, which does not really work for us, does it? Lord, just let, let, let me pray on it. Let me think on it. Let, let me just see if this is really you. And we see that happen in Scripture. Gideon throws out the fleece, not once, but twice. We see that there's different things that people are, are they're wanting to confirm to make sure they hear from God. But most of the time when we use that tactic, what are we really doing? We just stalling. We know in our heart of hearts that this is the will of God. We know that it is Him speaking. We know exactly what He wants us to do. We just don't want to do it. And so we stall. And we delay. When we look at obedience in Scripture, that's not the picture we see at all. Obedience should be done without delay. Because parents back me up on this. Delayed obedience really isn't obedience at all, is it? If you tell your kid, hey, trash day is Tuesday, you need to take the trash out Monday night. If the trash is still sitting there come Thursday morning and then they take it out, have they been obedient? No. You still miss the opportunity. But folks, that's how we operate with God often. Or just let me think about it. Let me get my ducks in a row. Let me make sure this is exactly what I need to do. And what happens? We stall and we stall and we stall until the opportunity passed. Then we say, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And what we find is that we've been disobedient. Folks, we have to act obediently. But that means no terms, no conditions. And I give it to him when he asks. You ever thought about this? If God had wanted you to take advantage of an opportunity later... Why wouldn't he just call you to it then? The fact that he's calling you to it right now, you know what that tells me? The opportunity is now. The time to act is now. The time for obedience is now, not later. You say, but preacher, that's scary. Hey, that's the whole point. We don't have to be afraid of giving God our obedience because he's big enough to take care of us in the middle of it. See, when we act obediently, we're saying with our actions that we trust God more than we trust our circumstances. I don't have to know how it's going to turn out. I don't have to be assured that everything's going to go smoothly. I just have to give him my obedience knowing that he's going to handle it. And then I trust him more than I do anything else that's going to come up. If you want to overcome fear in your life and take part in God's plan, act obediently. Give him what he wants when he asks for it. There's one more thing I want us to see here. If we want to overcome our fears and take part in the plan that God has for each and every one of us, the assignment that he's given us, we've got to learn to leave the results to him. Remember, what's our part in all of this? Listen and act. I gotta be still enough to listen and hear instructions. Then I gotta be bold enough to act when he calls me to act. 
Listen and act. That is my part. Nowhere, nowhere is it our job to produce the results. Read this book from cover to cover. I encourage you to over and over. You will not find anywhere where God says, look, I need you to take care of this for me. I need you to make this happen for me. No, God looks for people to come work alongside of him inside of his plan. And he says, I'll take care of it. I'll bring the results. I know what we need to do. It's not your job to produce results. That is God's job every single time. Moses had to realize before he ever stepped foot towards Egypt. He had to realize that he he was never going to be able to persuade Pharaoh to comply with God's commands. And that was okay. He was never going to be persuasive enough to make Pharaoh see it his way. He was never going to be able to be charismatic enough to move Pharaoh just by his personality alone. He was never going to be able to make it happen by himself. And that was okay. Moses had to realize that he was the messenger. God was the muscle. Some of us need to remember that right here, right now, today. We're scared to death of what God has called us to do because we don't think we can make it happen. And can I tell you, you probably can't. If it's of God, it's going to take God to get it done. You're just the messenger. He's the muscle. Do you find yourself stressing before the assignment even begins? Because you don't know if you'll be able to produce the results that you think it's going to take. My wife will tell you this is one of my biggest struggles. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can get us where we need to go. I don't know if I can make this happen or that happen. I'll stress over it. But you know what? More and more I'm reminded that the results aren't up to me. And they never have been. I'm responsible for giving God my effort and my ability. That's it. You are responsible for giving God your effort and your ability. He is responsible for the rest. It's Him. It's His plan. I want you to understand that God is never going to call you to anything that he doesn't already have a plan for. God doesn't wake up one morning and go, I don't know, I haven't really thought about this, and I guess we'll just wing it today. No, that is not him. He's never going to call you with an assignment that he hasn't already thought out. And because he's already thought it out, he knows what needs to be done. Because he knows what needs to be done, he knows what results are going to be. All he's looking for from you is to shut up and listen and act when he calls you. That's it. He'll handle the results. That's what he's responsible for. Today, I know God is calling many of us to things that make us afraid. You walked in this morning and it was weighing on you. You could see it on you. That God was speaking to you. He's calling you out for a purpose. He's got an assignment for you. And like Moses, you're going, but I don't know what to do. I don't know how to even start. And God says, it's okay. I've got a plan. You don't have to have it figured out because I do. Just listen to me and act when I call you to act. Today, take heart that God already knows what needs to be done. Here's the thing. He still picked you anyway. He still picked you to be a part of his plan. Even though he knows who you are, where you are, and what you got going. He picked you. Even when he looks at you and goes, they really are clueless. They don't have any idea where to go from here. He still picked you. The question is, are we going to say yes? Will we say yes today, or will we let fear keep us from following God's plan, God's assignment for each and every one of us?
My prayer is that we as a people, we as individuals, we as a congregation would say, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't get it. But I get you. Lord, I trust you. So whatever needs to be done, I know you've already got the plan set up. I'm in. May we give God what he's asking this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are a God who, Lord, has never, not once, been taken by surprise. God, in each and every situation, Lord, you've already got a plan, figured out how to deal with this and how to move forward, and Lord, to accomplish your will through it. Lord, I pray that as you call me to different assignments, Lord, as you pray, as you call each and every one of us to the assignments you've got laid out for us, Lord, we wouldn't let fear hold us back. But Lord, we would embrace those assignments wholeheartedly, knowing that God, our job is just to listen for you and act when you make yourself clear. Lord, knowing that you're going to do everything else. Lord, help us to not be afraid, but to trust you enough to do what it is you've called us to do. Lord, I pray as we go into this time of response, that, Lord, you would speak loud and clear to our hearts. Lord, if we've been holding back, if we've been hesitant, God, may that end today. Lord, fear no longer controlling us. Lord, I ask you to have your will and your way in each and every one of us. We love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand, please. Folks, that's it. We can trust him with that, can't we? I don't have to look to the world or anybody else to make sense of something for me. I don't have to look to myself to make sense of anything. I'm just going to trust him. And I'm going to do what he wants me to do. That's my prayer as we go into this week. I don't know what opportunities God's got laying in front of us, but I know he's got them. I pray that whatever it is, whether we think it's something big or small, every single time, yes, we'll do it. We're all in. We don't have to be afraid because he's in control. All right. Uh, anything else this morning? Don't forget, uh, we'll take just a short break, and then uh, we'll meet back in here for business meeting.
Uh, so if you got anything important that you want to bring up, make sure you got your ducks in a row so that uh, we can get that taken care of. But anyway, we'll do that after, like I said, just a short break. All right, nothing else? Nominating committee will be immediately after that. Uh, so I know if your stomach's going to start growling, mine will too, and it'll be contagious. So we'll try and make this quick. But that's right. All right, well, uh, AJ, will you dismiss us this morning?